All right, got it. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Cami for a little introduction. Thanks, Jiang. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're really excited to be here and chatting with you this morning about campaign readiness and fundraising capacity building, um, particularly through a community centric lens. Uh, it's really important to us, um, as Sarah was talking about, to ensure that when we think about resourcing our work, um, that we think about it in the context of the broader community, how we are additive, not extractive to our communities. Um, like Ji Young, I am an independent fundraising consultant. Um, and when we combine our powers, we are a collective called Freedom Conspiracy. We are part of a collective with a few other folks too. We are primarily fundraising consultants. We are all women of color. Uh, we also work with an indigenous research and evaluation specialist to bring that perspective to our work as well. Um, and we root our practice in social justice and racial equity. And we are, um, you know, we're building a methodology that requires a lot of analysis and interrogation and creativity and radical transparency. And we're trying to bring those values to, um, to the fundraising sector, both in this region and beyond. So today, we're going to define campaign readiness and fundraising capacity. Um, we're you know, thinking about this and how do we build a foundation for a capital campaign? Uh, we work with a lot of community-based organizations who may be building their fundraising muscle but have their eyes on the horizon toward a capital campaign. And so today's really gonna be focusing on how do we get that foundation in place? Um, how do we not jump from you know, A to Z? How do we make sure we're really scaffolding this process so that your campaign can be successful even if it does take some time? Jiang's gonna go through a few case studies to uh, share a couple of organizational profiles, um, you know, org, orgs that we've seen specifically, scenarios that we've seen specifically, and then also the specific recommendations um, and capacity building that we have recommended and supported um, those organizations to begin pursuing. And then we're gonna break into two groups. Uh, we asked you, and if you didn't respond to the survey, that's of course totally fine. We asked you to sort of let us know which way or which group you were most interested in joining, but there's going to be a case for support and storytelling group that's also looking at grant fundraising specifically. Um, and then Jiang's going to be leading a DIY fundraising feasibility study group and also looking at individual giving strategies and DevOps. Um, you know, depending on the size of the, each group, it'll sort of, uh, that'll dictate kind of how the facilitation and that experience looks. But we are encouraging you to come to that breakout session, whichever one you picked with something in mind to share with us about what you're hoping to gain um, from that space, a, a question or a scenario that you'd like to bring. And um, we'll kind of go from there and figure out the best way to um, you know, pull themes and pull ideas that can be most generative for, for the whole space. Thanks, Cami. Um, some logistics, we're here for two hours together. We'll take a break halfway through before our breakout rooms. We're aiming for a break around 11. Um, in the meantime, please take care of yourselves, you know, stay hydrated, take a bio break, whatever you need. Um, and then I have attached a copy of the slides to, to chat. If you don't get it, or if, I think everyone will have access to it, even if you joined after I um, shared, but let me know. I um, want you to have access to it now so you can look at it on your own computer if that's more helpful. Okay. All right. So, campaign readiness. Um, for those of you who were in the se last session, um, oh, yes, I can reshare. Let me do that real quickly. There we go. Okay. Resharing now. 
So for those of you who were in the last session, we did a capital campaign 101. We went over a bunch of general capital campaign terms, um, including feasibility studies, um, prospect research, donor pyramid, et cetera. And we talked about how those traditional campaign uh, fundraising planning strategies and terms are rooted in white ways of doing business. And the model is really organized around organizations that are really well resourced and have traditionally structured fundraising teams to execute the work that is required. So how can nonprofits and community groups who don't necessarily have the, um, the staffing infrastructure or don't have a history um, and, and tradition of doing traditional fundraising plan and prepare and execute capital campaign fundraising? And that's something that we'll be talking about today. Um, I, I want to take time right now to name that the barriers community groups face to funding and resources, especially BIPOC-led and serving organizations, are really enormous. The playing field is unlevel, and we know that fundraising and philanthropy is really relational. And oftentimes, white leaders of organizations have personal networks and professional networks um, that some leaders don't. And I can think of you know, many examples of white leaders getting access to capital through personal networks. Um, you know, there's a, there was an ED whose children did activities with the children of wealthy Seattle families, and she was able to recruit board members and volunteers um, through her personal network. Um, there was an ED that I knew whose friend was a partner with a program officer at a really well-known, famous uh, local foundation, was able to secure a really large capital grant through a, through a meeting request. Um, and so the process is really opaque sometimes, and it can be overwhelming and discouraging to think about successfully funding your project um, with this in the background. But there are also things that we can do that are within our control and can help position us and our organizations to make asks when the timing is right, um, which is what how we define campaign readiness. And um, so the way we define campaign readiness is that the key decisions and action steps required to successfully plan, launch, and complete a campaign. And so our definition for campaign readiness and fundraising capacity, which is really tied to campaign readiness, are broad and focused on leveraging an organization's existing strengths and working with what you have and what you have control over to move forward. Um, so, This is how we define fundraising capacity. So fundraising capacity, which is a part of campaign readiness, is really the tactical investments that deepen an organization's ability to move and accept resources. So fundraising capacity is a way to ground your work in community-centric fundraising principles. And often when we work with organizations getting ready for campaigns, we focus first on fundraising capacity, meaning that we work on making base level investments to make sure an organization is really ready to do fundraising work. Any questions about these definitions? And please feel free to chime in and chat um, and interrupt me. We'd love to have conversations. So when we think about fundraising capacity, we know that capacity means different things for different organizations based, for, uh, based on organizational life cycle, um, structure, et cetera. But typically groups really wanna address the following when they think about fundraising uh, capacity. So the first is, are we in right relationship with community? And when we say that, we are really thinking about are we ethically, can we ethically ask for resources? Are we in a position to use those resources um, wisely? And does community value our work? And can we name that and articulate that back to community? And do we have partners who will support us along the journey? Meaning that we're not doing this work alone. We're not, um, you know, we're not a silo that's trying to do everything by ourselves. And the second thing that um, we really, want to focus on when we think about fundraising capacity is do we have the people with the necessary skills? Do we have staff? Do we have the right volunteers? Is our board um, working and engaged in our work? And do we have community advocates? And I think this piece is really important for groups who are thinking about launching a capital campaign or doing more robust fundraising. Um, too often we see organizations asking existing staff um, who are doing program work or admin work to take on fundraising responsibilities on top of their current job duties. And it's an untenable long-term solution. Um, fundraising, especially fundraising, um, requires a lot of time. It requires you to build strategy. It requires you to build trust. And it absolutely requires an organization to make investments in human capacity um, and to honor people's time and the work that it requires to do the work right. 
So we also think about administrative systems and policies to accept and move resources. So um, do you have a place to track and manage relationships with funders and donors? Meaning it's not on a notepad or in someone's inbox, but that this information is stored in an accessible place um, and it's designed to hold the institutional knowledge and history for everyone involved in the organization to access. Um, it could be that do you have a way to make decisions? Do you have an agreed upon way to have difficult conversations? And do we know who can make the kind of decisions that we need to make? It could mean that you have to create a budgeting process that allows you to plan for the future. And lastly, do you have a plan for fundraising? And so do you have a fundraising plan that answers to what end are we asking community to move resources to our work? And so a plan for fundraising can be simply an outline of how you resource your work in your organization. Um, this can often be tied to an organization's budgeting process, and the plan can be really simple. It could be a narrative document that outlines the type of resourcing activities that you do in a given year. And this document can be used as a roadmap and become an accountability tool that you can use with other staff, with board members, volunteers, and other community members. So that's a high level overview of fundraising capacity and kind of high level questions that we often use with organizations as they think about how do we build out fundraising capacity for our organization. Nope, excuse me. All right, so we had to find campaign readiness as the process of making strategic decisions um, that an organization has to make in order to plan, launch, and execute a successful capital campaign. And so that, again, fundraising capacity is a part of campaign readiness. And the other part of campaign readiness is really tackling strategic decisions that focus on big picture. So organizations can and should have a long-term strategy conversation with each other, with board, about fundraising as they're getting ready for a campaign. So questions potentially to ask include, you know, how will this campaign allow us to better serve community? What does a sustainable, meaningful funding model look like for us? Um, what kind of gifts do we want to accept as we do different types of fundraising? And so to that end, we ask the following questions to provide shape to the kind of campaign fundraising organizations would like to do. So as you're getting ready for a campaign, we really want to think about vision. Can we share to what end we're asking for resources? Can we share impact? How will this campaign allow us to better serve community? And can we be specific in articulating our impact? And then accountability, what kind of gifts do we want to accept and from whom? Are there certain types of gifts that we don't want to accept? Are there certain uh, donors that we don't want to have or that we do want to be in relationship with? And can we name that specifically? And then money, what is our ideal funding model for our organization? And I think this is a really interesting conversation and we'll, we'll try to do it as a group together today in a little bit, but what does it mean for your organization to be funded and resourced in a way that's whole? And which is totally tied to the next question is around freedom, what would this funding model allow us to accomplish? And so many times I know organizations are reliant on restricted grants. And maybe that serves your organization in a really good way and you don't wanna change that because it allows you to do what you need to do. Other times, maybe those restrictions are truly restrictive um, and you'd like to have more unrestricted funding. And what would that unrestriction, unrestricted dollars allow you to do and accomplish in your work on behalf of community? So I think the other piece to think about, um, we see organizations and community groups think that they have to fundraise in a certain way because they've been told that capital campaign fundraising you know, is a certain way and there are certain things that you have to do. But we think it's really important to interrogate these assumptions to ensure that the fundraising an organization adopts is values aligned and rooted in a realistic action and strategy that truly serves your community. Um, I think it's unrealistic to think that an organization that has like three staff do the type of capital campaign fundraising that an organization has, you know, that has 20 staff. So thinking about how do we right size our capital campaign fundraising for our organization um, and make sure that it's rooted in values and community centric practices. And so that begins by taking time to name and articulate a relational approach to money and moving resources for your organization. So how do we remain accountable to community through our fundraising work? We could ask ourselves, does the impact of our work change if we shift how and from whom we accept resources? And do we actually want to do the kind of fundraising that capital campaign uh, fundraising model tells us that we have to do? And maybe the answer is no, and maybe the answer is yes. It all depends on the organization. 
So there are no right one answer, uh, right answers to these questions. They're very specific to your organization. And part of getting campaign ready is having those difficult, more um, strategic conversations with each other and with staff and board members to make sure that you're all on the same page about how you'd like to move forward. Any questions about campaign readiness, the slides that I just went over? No? Okay. I'm gonna turn it over to Cami for a group conversation. Okay, we're just gonna pause and, and ask you to reflect on your current funding model. And I'm gonna share a poll in a minute, but um, I'll just go through these here. The first one is, are you currently funded mostly by grants, both public or private? Are you funded by contracts? Contracts are typically also public, but they're distinct from grants in specific ways. Contracts you may have applied to be a vendor, and so you're contracted that way. Contracts you often have to invoice monthly, and so there are cash flow implications if you're contract funded. Um, maybe you uh, benefit from a diverse portfolio of funders, including grants and unrestricted donations from individuals, and maybe you're not sure. So just to get a sense of who's in the room today and kind of where everyone's at, I'm gonna launch a poll. You should see it come up and you can pick one of these, um, just whichever one best reflects where you're at right now. Um, and then I'll share the responses in a moment. So it looks like we've got a lot of folks who are funded by grant, mostly grants, and then about half are funded by a combo. And this is, I think, you know, this is about what we expected to see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with this breakdown, we aren't seeing, we aren't, you know, saying what percentage, <laughs> uh, but we work with a lot of organizations that are more grant reliant. Um, grants are a very accessible to smaller organizations that, like Ji Young mentioned, may not already be connected to fundraising networks. Um, private foundations and then the city and the county are also looking to support by and for and community led groups. Um, also just younger organizations earlier in their life cycle, grant fundraising can be a really strong foundation building um, strategy for your organization. And, and once you start to feel like you have sustained or stabilized using grants funding, you can have maybe a little more flexibility to think about other types of fundraising if that interests you. Um, but, we wanted to just share this as a, a reflection point to continue what Jiang was sharing earlier around what type of fundraising do you really want to do? Um, and so we'll ask the question, Jiang, if you wanna to go to the next slide. What would you change about your current funding model? Um, and another way, to ask this too is what kind of fundraising would you like to do more of? Or what kind of fundraising would you like to do in, in addition or instead of what you're doing? Um, so we'll ask you to think about that for a moment and feel free to raise your hand and you can share or you can pop something into the chat as well. And of course, if you don't want to change your funding model, you can share that too.
Yeah, we have a few folks that are sharing that they'd like to diversify and get a little, get more funding from individuals and earned income. So there's not as much pressure or um, just a, a larger percentage of funding coming from your foundations. Mm -hmm. More individual giving. more potentially multi-year gifts, deeper relationships with donors that can be longer lasting, recurring gifts. Moving away from heavy restrictions. Just a fuller, more diverse funding model in general building up individual giving. And these are, when we think about this, as you're looking at a campaign, these decisions that you make internally at the organization that you discuss with your board, that you discuss with you know, the campaign committee that you're building, these decisions inform the types of, of fundraising capacity that you will invest in. And that's why it's really worth doing this reflection and making those choices to say, we are the type of organization that we do want to leverage the folks in our community and fundraising to build community and to build and energize momentum around this capital campaign. Some organizations we work with don't want to for cultural reasons, um, because they have really strong and deep relationships with city and county folks and they can they feel confident in their funding streams. Um, and so when Jiang starts going and starts sharing case studies, we can show in a little more in detail what the implications from a capacity building standpoint are of some of these decisions. Jiang, is there anything you would add? No. Um... I think all you know the needs that you all outlined in your in the chat um, can be really tied to then what does what would this funding model make possible for you all, and I think that's a really hopeful conversation that you could have inside um, with your staff and with your board, and allows you to help kind of start connecting the campaign vision and plan to to your aspirations around what a funding model that meets your needs. Um, what that could look like and what that allows you to do. So thank you for sharing, that's great. All right, okay, so we're right on time. Um, we're gonna do some case studies. I'm gonna offer two case studies and Seattle is a city, but we're still pretty small. So I won't be using names. I've removed identifying details in order to honor confidentiality. Um, and so both case studies I'll be sharing, I'll give you, they're, they're both capital campaign case studies. Um, we'll focus on what the groups did to increase fundraising capacity and get themselves strategically ready for a capital campaign. So case study number one is an arts organization. It's a youth, youth serving arts organization. Um, they're displaced from their home and they had 12 month notice um, to, to vacate the space. Um, so they have no, no new space identified, but had a full year to plan the move. Their budget was heavily reliant on ticket sales. They had some public and private grants to fund performances and artist residencies, et cetera, and had a very small individual donor base. So it was diversified in one sense, but also lopsided in another sense. Um, they, the individual giving base was really from an online giving button that they had on their website. It was very passive. They never sent out direct appeals. They had a small staff and a moderate volunteer base that engaged with them at their, um, at their shows and no dedicated fundraising staff. So the ED did most of the fundraising, um, which was mostly you know, grant writing and being in relationship with long-term funders. So they were in a position where they had to do some kind of capital campaign to find a new space. And they chose to spend the, um, the six months on campaign readiness and fundraising capacity in the following ways. So they've really focused on campaign readiness and they part of that work is taking some time to think about what's next um, and 
launching an intentional process to address vision, the, the six things that we talked about in campaign readiness, which is vision, impact, accountability, money, and freedom. Sorry, the five things. Um, so they knew that this move was an opportunity for them to really hear from youth and community about what they envisioned in their new home. And so they focused first on visioning. Um, what are we working towards? And they did the visioning work by holding internal and external visioning sessions. These were facilitated by an outside person. And they also held one-on-one -on -one interviews with key uh, youth and other leaders who couldn't attend those visioning sessions to make sure that they got feedback um, from everyone who was really critical to the shaping of their campaign vision. And they gathered information from these sessions and interviews and created the foundation of what would become a case for support. And so the case for support for the campaign was drafted internally by staff and the board, but it really um, outlined the impact, which was tied to these visioning conversations about what is it that we're building and how will it impact and change community. And then staff worked with the board to create some draft budgets. And so they created two, five, 10 year um, draft budget scenarios that articulated potential growth, named what was needed cash wise in order to purchase or lease future property. And this budgeting process was really important because they were able to use the budget projections to paint a picture during community engagement phase, which is the third phase, um, about what they needed and what their plans were. So the budget, along with the case for support language from the visioning sessions, um, became a tool, became a fundraising tool that they could use to test the idea of a capital campaign with community members, city officials, funders, individual donors, et cetera. So this is kind of an arc of a very um, traditional fundraising feasibility study where you get a vision together, you draft a case for support, outline a draft budget, and notice that everything says draft because these are just ideas and um, in anticipation of a finalized plan in order to test those in a community engagement phase. So the testing of the case happens during this phase where, you, where the organization gathered focus groups. They uh, reached out to individuals for one-on-one -on -one interviews and they conducted an online survey with um, folks on their email list. And they gathered all the feedback from these conversations and it became the basis of a campaign plan. Um, and during these conversations with um, you know, community, they asked very specific questions. So before the interviews, they spent time thinking about who do we wanna to talk to and why do we wanna to talk to these people? And what do we wanna know from our conversations to help us launch a campaign? And so they asked people, you know, would you fund this project based on this case for support that we're sharing with you? If so, what range of gift would you consider? So they were very explicit in their, um, in their asks, in their interviews. They asked, would you be willing to partner with us once this campaign launches? Would you introduce us to others who might invest in our work? They asked about what, you know, what additional information do you need from us in order for you to be fully on board with this project? Um, they asked, do you know any developers or real estate people who might have leads on potential spaces? Do you have connections to architects who can help us design once we're ready? Um, so they really spent some time thinking about who they wanted to talk to in order to help them accomplish their goals for campaign planning. The ED and the board member conducted most of these conversations um, and they were you know, it took a lot of time. And so that's, it's a huge time investment in writing, tracking and writing down all those responses and synthesizing that is a lot of work. Any questions about campaign readiness here? Again, feel free to chime in. Okay. And can I add one thing? Yeah, please. For, and we can talk about this more in the, in the case for support breakout for whoever's interested, but this process, while you know, we're talking about campaign readiness through the lens of fundraising, it's really important that this process is not just focusing on potential donors mm -hmm. and that we're thinking about, you know, in that visioning conversation, the visioning conversation is the base for your case for support narrative. And so who do we want to be in that room? Whose voice is critical in ensuring that the case for support is truly reflective of what the community thinks about this project. Mm -hmm. And so in, to ensure that your case is truly meaningful, um, 
we want to make sure that we that you are inclusive of potential donors and of course beyond potential donors and that is also true for the community engagement piece where you want to say does this case resonate with you with other members of your community with your constituents um and think about you know what does partnership look like mm -hmm. and having just an expansive framework for what visioning and community engagement in this process looks like. Yeah, thanks, Cami. I think that's really important. And thank you for naming that. Um, part of the work that we do too is to really think about community and through um, community mapping exercises to make sure that we're intentionally thinking about community before we do our visioning and community engagement phase. So that's really critical. All right. So this group did some fundraising capacity and um, it was three pronged. First, they spent some of their, um, they had some capacity, uh, capacity building money from a grant and they hired a part-time grant writer. And this was critical because it increased the executive director's capacity to do other types of fundraising and campaign readiness work. Um, you all know with grants like it can it can be a huge time suck. So that was huge. The grant writer was also able to do prospect research for the organization and created a tracking of um, grants for the organization and brought a new level of strategy to fund our relations that was much needed. Um, they purchased a, purchased a really affordable donor CRM and to start tracking and managing funder and donor relationships in one place. And then they built an annual fundraising planning calendar that focused on building out individual giving program aimed at tapping into their existing ticket buyers. So, their plan really meant making some basic investments um, in time. So they leveraged their existing email list by cleaning it up and segmenting it based on, you know, engagement, zip code, et cetera. They created and implemented a monthly e-newsletter plan. So they created an e a newsletter template. They mapped out a full year of uh, content topics. And then they worked with the staff, worked together to take turns making weekly social media posts about their work and their um, partnerships. So a really simple annual plan, but it gave them a starting place um, that was manageable and feasible with the existing staff that they had. Any questions or comments about this case study? What was the affordable donor CRM bill? Yeah, um, they chose a system called Little Green Light, and I'm going to actually share a little uh, a table in my breakout, and I'll share. I can share it with the whole group um, of different CRM options, and. Um, in my opinion, Little Green Light is the most accessible and easy to use and doesn't require a monthly fee. Um, and you pay based on the number of records that you have. And um, I can, I'll share that information. The next um, or group didn't use uh, Little Green Light. They used Airtable. And I'll talk about that in a second. It's not a technically a CRM, but it is a database tool that some organizations use to um, track funder and donor relations. Okay. All right. So case study two is community. It's a community environmental group. Um, their land was being sold by their landlord. Um, they had been on this space for 15 plus years. And all of a sudden the, the landlord, um, which was another community group needed, needed the, the cash. And so they wanted to sell the land. They gave the group the option to purchase the property and they set a timeline so they can buy the, um, they would have six months to come up with a down payment if they wanted to purchase the property. Um, it was an all volunteer run group, no paid staff. Fundraising to date had been a few public grants and some small fundraising events. So tickets um, to events, bake sales, et cetera. So the challenges here is that they had to move really fast because um, they didn't have anything close um, in their bank reserves to pay for a down payment. And as an all volunteer organization, they had no administrative or systems infrastructure and had to quickly develop new ways of working together to meet the urgency. Um, of the moment. So for campaign readiness, this group decided um, to organize a core leadership group. And this core leadership group created a campaign budget and a fundraising timeline based on the cost to purchase the property. And the core group created then a phased plan. So phase one was we need down payment money right now. How are we gonna get that? So that was create a plan to get our down payment. Phase two was to find a lender to hold a loan at a reasonable rate, 
to talk with city county officials to get sightlines on public dollars and then raise the remainder of the purchase amount through individual and private foundation donors. And lastly, they created volunteer campaign subcommittees with two to three people each in each subcommittee. So the subcommittees allowed the group to share the work and hopefully prevent burnout um, and volunteers. So there was a campaign management committee in charge of project managing the campaign and leading accountability check-ins with other subcommittees. There was a fundraising committee and that committee had three people. So one person was focused on private donations from individuals, private foundations, et cetera. Someone else was focused on public dollars how do we get access to public money? And then someone else was focused on list management, tracking conversations, and tracking fundraising progress towards goal. They also created a, a communications and marketing committee, and that committee was really focused on getting the word out about the campaign and the land purchase out into the broader community. So they did very tactical things like creating an e-newsletter template and regular content. They built a simple news uh, website that had a way for people to sign up for a newsletter and communications pieces. And a volunteer was in charge of regular social media posts on behalf of the campaign. For fundraising capacity in this group, they really focused on um, information management through a simple and easily accessible platform. So Google Drive, creating a shared Google Drive, one person was in charge of creating the infrastructure for that system. Um, and then they set up an Airtable template um, for a donor database. And if folks don't know Airtable, you can um, Google it. It's, um, and there's lots of different templates embedded into Airtable that you can use. It's not a true uh, donor database. It, it's not as sophisticated as something like Little Green Light, but, um, but it can be used effectively to track relationships. And then they also really set up a, um, a structured meeting times about how they're going to meet, how often they were going to meet to hold each other accountable and to move the project forward because they were on such a, time, a short timeline for the down payment. And then they also made some budget investments. We talked about the new website. They added an online donation button. They also inv invested in an email platform um, so they could use a simple platform to get the message out to a broad group of people. And then they invested um, in a grants prospect research uh, contract with a grants contractor. And so they worked with a grants consultant to do prospect research. The grants consultant created a tracking tool for them to use, did some research around potential uh, funders who might be willing or interested um, in funding this type of capital project. So these are kind of high level overviews there. Um, it, I think the challenge is that these forms make it look like it was really simple. Of course, it was really hard. Of course, it was complicated. Um, but I think both organizations really spent time to think about what do we need, need to do on the fundraising capacity side to make sure that we're ready? And what big conversations do we need to have um, in order for us to really address the case and the community need and impact and the larger conversations that we need to have to, uh, to fund our project? Um, and Bill, you had asked what was the email platform. They chose to go with MailChimp, um, which is a very common um, email platform. And I'll also include that in my in the chart. Um, and then you had take, made a comment about LGL taking serious investment in staff time and training. Um, it does take staff time and training to implement a new donor database. Um, if folks have experience, I'd love to hear from you all. But um, for folks who are, for organizations that are just starting out, with a donor CRM, um, it can be also liberating to have all your information in one place, but it does take investment in time and it does take investment in training to make sure that you can set up the system in a way that's, um, that's usable for the future. Kim, is there anything you would add to case studies or what we just talked about? I don't think so. I think they would just echo that um, the upfront cost, this, that is what the importance of fundraising capacity and building that foundation um, the upfront cost of the donor database, uh, thinking about staffing, and that even that you can receive checks, that you can process donations, um, super important, just foundational building decisions to make. And, and there's definitely an upfront, both just investment cost and, and time, money, and capacity. Mm -hmm. I, we offer these two case studies in that um, you'll notice that they didn't add staff other than they hired a contractor as focused on grants because they were that's the kind of fundraising they were already doing. And I think that's important um, 
for us because we oftentimes work with organizations that don't have the financial capacity to hire new staff or add someone to payroll to do fundraising work in that current moment. And so it is possible, I think, to add fundraising capacity to your organization and slowly build towards the human capacity, the hiring of new staff to do the fundraising work um, so that it's not you know, an either or, but it's a way to build towards something where you have a more robust team to do the kind of fundraising work that you're looking to do. Any comments or questions? Okay, so it's about 10.50. Let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back at 10.55 um, and we'll go into breakout rooms and we'll, we'll do that after we go on break. Sound good? Yes. All right. Okay, see you all in five minutes. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, welcome back. We are about to go into breakout rooms. Um, but before we talk about breakout rooms, anything that folks wanted to talk about or share or contemplate in a large group before we do that? Ian, do you think it's worth answering the question in the chat maybe as a full group? Sure. Yeah, so asked about, bye Alina, see you later. Bye Alina. Um, so going over some of the most effective things orgs can do um, and the biggest potential pitfalls to look out for when it comes to readiness. Yeah, so I think one of the, um, the pitfalls that, and th things to avoid Cami named earlier, um, really making, being sure that your visioning process um, is inclusive of community and, and that the people who are shaping the vision and the hope and the impact of your capital campaign are being shaped by those most impacted by your work and those who are at the center of your work. And so when I, um, I'll be sharing kind of a DIY uh, fundraising feasibility study process and part of that work I mentioned is community mapping. Oftentimes with white-led orgs, we, um, we try to work with organizations to veer away from mapping just their donor universe and mapping their full community. Um, and then on the converse side is how do we map our universe of um, community to identify potential supporters in our work? Um, are we not asking enough? Are we asking the same people over and over again? Um, how are we in relationship with, with our community to make sure that we can do resourcing in a way that is that feels good and is rooted in community? So I think community mapping and making sure that your work is really community centered is really important at every single phase of readiness work. Um, and I think the other pitfall to look for in readiness and fundraising capacity is creating a giant plan, giant fundraising plan, giant campaign plan, but you don't have the necessary staff, volunteers, people to execute the plan. Because you can have a beautiful written plan that looks really good on paper, but you, if you don't have the staff capacity or the people capacity to execute that plan, it's gonna feel awful. You're not gonna be able to succeed. And so how do you create a plan that's right size for the organization that you are? Um, and how do you manage expectations with your board? Um, if you are you know, if you're a, a, not an ED, if you're with your leadership um, around what can you expect in fundraising? Um, because I think people have different ideas and concepts in relationship to money and fundraising. And, um, and sometimes the expectations are that you're gonna do you know, miraculous things in 12 months. And that's just not how fundraising works. It's relational, it takes time um, and it requires people to, uh, to do the work. So those would be the two things that I really would um, identify as potential pitfalls and things to look out for. Cami, what would you add? Yeah, I think what we've seen that is related to everything Jan just mentioned, but and part of why we decided to focus in on this concept um, for this presentation is that we see a lot of organizations who kind of jump to the campaign plan um, before really reflecting about 
reflecting on what kind of fundraising capacity is necessary. And to Jiang's point, that comes from a place of there might be misconceptions about fundraising. Um, there might be misconceptions about um, kind of just the strategy and process and, and time and capacity necessary to fundraise. For, is, for a capital campaign is, is typically a significantly, wildly, much larger fundraising campaign than anything else an organization has ever done for a lot of the community-based organizations we work with. And so it's a, it's a process of, of recon reconciling really that fundraising is a profession and it is a skill and that in order to truly launch a campaign that needs to be reconciled and honored in some way. Um, and we just work with a lot of organizations where I'd say the pitfall is, is sort of not, not having done that reconciliation and just saying, please tell us what to do now to launch this campaign. We are going, we need this money in six months kind of thing. And so we pivot and we say, actually, we need to do really fundamental fundraising capacity building work first. Um, and so we're trying, you know, to kind of avoid the pitfall so that um, our partners don't end up in a really difficult situation that um, you know, they end up having to spend even more time and money and resources to then try and resolve. Um, so yeah, I think just acknowledging and reconciling uh, the need for fundraising capacity building and campaign readiness work is in itself helps to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen. Um, the way that I've thought, been thinking about it is like some of the organizations we work with are kind of like building the roof. They're putting the weather vane on the roof already, um, but there's no foundation yet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's yeah. what I would add. Thanks, Cami. All right, any, again, any comments or questions, please feel free to chime in. I know, Jamie, you had asked about a, a template for annual fundraising plan. Um, yes, I think there are lots of templates. And I, the only caveat I would add to that is um, first thinking about what kind of fundraising you want to do and then creating a fundraising plan that's responsive to that. Um, so it goes back to, do you want a fundraising plan that's um, new and that um, outlines and articulates new strategies and initiatives for fundraising? Or do you want a fundraising plan that tracks your current work or a combination of both? So really creating a plan that um, meets you in the moment and happy to talk with you, Jamie, about what that template could look like. Um, all right, should we do breakout rooms? Sure, let's do it. Okay. Caroline, do you want me to do the breakouts? I can go ahead and open them. Um, okay. So everyone will get to choose between um, the two different rooms. Um, so when I open them now, you should um, be able to select which one you'd like to join. Hi, Allie. See you later. And if anyone can't select one, um, you can just add it to the chat or say it out loud and I can move you. Hi, this is Curtis. I don't see the options. Uh, I know in the email yeah. yesterday, I selected one, I believe it was around the storytelling. Great. Can move you over there. Thank you. And Jamie, which one did you want to be in? Hey, DIY. Um, Caroline, do you see that? I do, yep. I'll move. I see Shiho and Jamie. Great. And Jaguna wants to be in case for support. Um, yep, I moved Thank Shaguna. You. And we'll have the breakout groups go until 
Bill, do you have a preference on which group to join? Oh. I think he joined. And then it looks like we've just got Paige. Do you want to join group one or group two? Can you tell me what the groups were again? Yes, group one would be the case for support um, and storytelling. And then group two is the DIY fundraising. I'd like the DIY fundraising. Great. And um, Paige, I see that you're on um, two times. I'm just going to move both of your accounts to the DIY fundraising. Yeah, that's OK. I was listening in the car on my way home. No problem. We're glad you could join us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Caroline, am I a co-host as well? You are, yeah. And I need to figure out, for some reason, the timer went on, so it's only giving people like 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I can just disagree. disregard it once it goes oh, off. Well, I'm hoping. Yeah, they can probably see it on the top corner of their screen, but okay. I think at least there's a facilitator in each one. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to good. hop into um, them both anyway to check it out. So why don't I hop into it real quickly and just um, put a message in the chat to ignore the timer. Um, and then I'll come back. I think I can move this myself. Well, let me move myself. Um, oh, right. Totally forgot about the broadcasting option. It's so. not great though. Like, I feel like unless you are like looking at that spot in the screen. So true. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can move you though if you want to. Yeah. If, would, yeah. Just. I think. Okay. Hopefully. I, yeah. Would you move me to the first one, and then hopefully I'll be yeah. able to move up to the second. Yeah. Go back to the main room and move me again. Great. Slowly. Okay, cool. Welcome back. I hope everyone had a good time in your breakout rooms. Um, anything anyone want to share from your breakout rooms or any reflections or comments? Let's 
from our group, I will be sharing some resources that I shared in our small uh, group out with the COO and hoping that maybe we can email it out to the team, to everyone who attended and who's interested. Okay. And um, yeah, Cami, is there anything you wanna add? I do promise resources, I have to create them first. <laughs> So, <laughs> so it might, it might not be until next week, but I'll, Sarah, if it's okay, I'll reach out with you and maybe, maybe we can send it one more, one more email out to the group once that's pulled together. But I promise just some high level grant seeking and grant strategy process. Um, and then also some suggestions around um, media platforms and, and visual storytelling tools uh, when you are as part of uh, sharing out your know, communications and marketing. Awesome, cool. Well, I think for the last part, I wanted to um, let you all know that there's technical assistance sessions um, available. Um, there will be a form that we'll share with folks um, that uh, we'd like you all to fill out if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one session that kind of helps us understand, you know, what, you're, what are you looking for in terms of support? Um, and help us prepare for our time together, but that'll be sent out soon. Sarah, is there anything you want to add around that? Yeah, um, so I just put the link for the evaluation survey um, into the chat, uh, and that's actually the first step for signing up for one of these one-on-one -on -one, um, technical assistance sessions with either Ji Young or Cami. so please, please, please fill it out if you are interested in um, one of those sessions. Again, there are some limited slots, so it will be first come, first serve. Um, once we have a list of who's interested, we'll send out another form that Ji Young was mentioning just to gather a little more information around what it is that you'd like to discuss so that Ji Young and Cami can prepare and make the best use of that time um, with each of you. And uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's free to the organization, it's being supported through COO. And so I hope that those of you who are interested will take advantage of that opportunity. Cool, awesome. Well, we have um, just five minutes, I'll be here. I'll stay on the remainder of the call if anyone wants to talk or have questions, but I wanna thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Cami, for being my partner. Thanks, um, thank Jen. you, Sarah, Sarah and Caroline and COO again for um, inviting us into this space. Um, yeah, so here, if you have questions or comments, please um, let us know, happy to, happy to connect. Absolutely, and before anyone jumps in with questions, because um, I'm sure at least one person will have one, I just wanna express my thanks again to Cami and to Ji Young. Um, it, it was really wonderful to be able to spend a little time in each of your breakout groups and just be able to um, take in the knowledge and skills and resources and ideas and case studies that you all have seen from your work um, in community and in the field. I was in a conversation the other day talking about how difficult it can be at times to find um, people of color uh, who are in this, this particular, um, you know, area having the expertise and the experience um, and resources to help raise funds for the critical work that each of you are doing in community. And so I'm grateful to each of you for designing and holding this space. And I also wanna express my appreciation to all of you who attended today um, because of the experience and expertise that you bring um, and the incredible work that you do. So thank you so much. Uh, if you do have any remaining questions, feel free to hang around for the last couple minutes. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. This is Tana. I think this is more of an ask for uh, Tammy um, because Ji Young was saying you're such a great storyteller and uh, just a great. <laughs> Um, uh, so when you're preparing your materials, can I make an additional ask in terms of like any good uh, case support tips or if you can provide also a case support? Because I feel like for me as a grant writer and also as a raider on the other side, I read so much case support or just so much proposals that after a while they start to blend in. So I really want to kind of like be more strategic on how can you can like really amplify the work um, and just showcase like the work that community is doing. And sometimes I feel like I'm stuck because I'm doing the work already and no more. So any tips and if you can provide an example um, of a, a case support, that would be great just to get another perspective. Sure, yeah. And I think 
and I know I mentioned this a lot in the breakout, maybe too much, but um, <laughs> when you think about community mapping and making sure that there are other stakeholders involved in the visioning work that leads to the case, that can also kind of help you as the writer get out of the grant writing mindset, sort of the groove of the record player, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you're hearing from other folks and hearing other perspectives and the case should, like Jiang had mentioned, is really a tool. It's not intended to be collateral in itself in the way that a grant is really external facing obviously to a specific audience, but the tool, the case for support is an internally facing story. Um, and so it's, it's really there to help the fundraising team and, and anyone who's speaking to, you know, outwardly, externally to really tell a cohesive and inspiring story that's actually coming from community and not just coming from the organization. Organization is obviously an important part of community, but not the only, not the only voice. Um, and so making sure that the case doesn't feel like a mouthpiece or something of the organization, but really that the organization is more um, translating or brokering between um, the community. Um, and so anyway, that process can really help get, get out of the, the rut of, of grant writing language, which we also want case for support to be a little bit more conversational, um, a little bit lighter and less technical. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I didn't see where Ji-Yung was saying you're such a great storyteller, even for this point, just you know, frame it in a for community perspective that sometimes we forget because we're in the weeds of the org so much. Mm -hmm. Trying to highlight the organizational work is just a great tip. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that process can also be very inspiring mm -hmm. too uh, for, for you and, and staff to just hear from community and, and hear their language. Yeah. I have a question regarding to the one-on-one -on -one assistance. Is there a limited of time sections or topics we can we can uh, ask for? Because the the ones the potential topics that you put it over there, I, I can definitely see that <laughs> those are all the area we need to learn more and uh, more tailored to what our organizations need. So I'm just wondering, what's the limitation of the assistance we are able to ask for? Ji Young, do you want to take that? Or would you like me to expand on um, that? Yeah, why don't you why don't you take that, Sarah? Okay, great. Um, so Ginger, right now I think that what we are able to offer is a limited number of hour long. We're doing hour long, is that right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Hour long sessions, um, one per organization, um, and the list of potential topics or kind of broad categories are in the slide deck um, that was shared earlier and will be sent out again. Um, but really, I am anticipating that Tammy and Ji Young want to be able to use the time to narrow, to drill into the specifics of um, what, for instance, open doors might be um, in the process of planning or strategizing right now as it falls within this larger umbrella of uh, capital campaigns and fundraising capacity, um, which is why there will be a after you fill out the evaluation survey, there will be a short kind of follow-up form to share more specifics about what you want to talk about during that session. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really appreciative. Um, and of course, if what we need is more than what you can offer, do Ji Young and Kami yourself also will accept, you know, will, will, will be working with us, you know, outside of COO, continue to support us as a consultant that we can get some feedback from you. Yeah, we can definitely be in conversation, Ginger. Um, we want to make sure that we're being really responsive to your needs and your organization's needs. So happy to have conversations with you during our session about what it is that you're looking for um, and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. Does that sound okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Awesome. Cool. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. This was great. It was great to connect with you, some of you a little more closely. Yeah, but. it was really great. Paige, you're at New Beginnings. Yeah, tell the team I say hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah.
Awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you, Jian. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks thank everyone. you so much. Thank you, Cami. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye. Happy soon. Have a good weekend, all. Bye.